Welcome to the Cyber Center for Biblical Studies. Hi, my name is Herb Bateman. Today we want to discuss a book written by James Smith entitled Desiring the Kingdom. Uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. Vic Anderson, Professor of Homiletics for the Pastoral Department here at Dallas Theological Seminary. Vic, welcome. Thank you. Um, this is a book you've read, and uh, from what I understand, a book that um, has um, uh, triggered uh, uh, your heart mm, in, 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 in a way. So as we, we think about this book, what might you might, how might you summarize the thesis of the book, the, the main thrust? Sure. Um, Dr. Smith has written a book to um, really, really speak to educators and pastors and help us grapple with the idea that so often when we are helping people, we are dealing in the area of uh, ideas and intellectual information. And he's calling us to take a step back and say, you know, maybe we need to think more deeply about formation as we think about information. And uh, so it's a call to try to help people um, be shaped in their desires, more specifically as the title indicates, to have to be desiring the kingdom as opposed to the other worldly desires that will grab us. Okay. Uh, how does he uh, go about uh, unfolding this idea? How does he uh, develop this idea? Maybe uh, chapter by chapter, parts, sections? What, uh, how does he unfold this yeah, thesis? He, he's really creative, and I think I just mentioned to you, this is the book I wish I would have written <laughs> because he's a, he's, he's a philosopher and an educator and also uh, very creative in the way that he writes. So um, if you get a chance to read this book, you'll, I think you'll be drawn in very quickly because he begins by... By, by doing an analysis of, the, he calls it the phenomenology of cultural liturgies. That's a fancy way of talking about how the world sucks us in. So he, he begins the book with a, an extended metaphor about what it's like to go to the mall. And he describes the mall as a, as a, as a worship experience. You go in and oh, the aromas captivate you and the, and the music captivates you and, you, and you're drawn in to the, to the, uh, the first shop. And there all the lights are, are present and of course merchandisers have worked to capture your attention. And then you finally find something and you go to the altar and you meet the priest and you engage in a transaction where you give something to the priest and the priest gives you something back. You walk out into the mall, you lose sense of time. Um, it, it's all this, uh, it makes you realize that there's a lot more going on than you and I might realize, kind of, if we're hunters and gatherers, we kind of go get that and bring it out. But in fact, there's a, there's a very carefully planned experience in the mall that is liturgical. And by liturgical, he means there's a repetitive experience that is meant to capture our desires and our identity and begin to shape our thinking of what is the good life. And so the good life in the mall experience, of course, is to be able to keep purchasing and, and wrap up in materialism. So that, that's only one example. But he, he sets that up for us and goes, now, what the people of the mall and their advertisers and television crews have done is they have, they have done a really good job of impacting and forming the desires of the customer. Mm -hmm. And then he begins to ask these questions. In the Christian school, in the seminary, in the Bible college, in, in the churches, how well do we work at the level of people's desires? And so he begins then to unpack the whole idea that in fact, um, we as people are desiring people. We're not just thinking machines. We are loving people, that God has made us that way. And he, he takes us from a, from a view of anthropology, of this is what people are like. And um, it, it, we begin to recognize that if, if people are loving individuals, that's, that's who we are, uh, and we only address them at the level of how they think, mm -hmm. that we're shortchanging them mm -hmm. in terms of their education, in terms of transformation. He even suggests, for example, let's throw out the whole idea of a worldview. Now, some may be offended by that, but he's trying to make a point that says, we've, we've talked so much about worldview and the way people think that we haven't dealt enough again, with desires. And so um, having kind of established that on a philosophical level, then uh, Dr. Smith's book goes and he, and he begins to think about, show that, that our desires are so quickly sucked into a world system, we, the desires of the flesh, and that we have to help people desire the kingdom, is the, the good life, if you will, in the scriptures itself. And I will tell you that not only as a, 
uh, a teacher of spiritual life, but just the book's not a devotional book per se, but I found myself deeply impacted because I was constantly reflecting on my own spiritual life and mm -hmm. saying, wow, I've settled for the mind sometimes when I really need to look at desires. Okay. Yeah. So how, did you consider that uh, that emphasis on desires as being something the, uh, that's being extremely insightful that you got from that? Oh, very much, very much. Because, I, again, uh, for those of us who, who spend a lot of time in education, you know, we, we, we traffic in the world of ideas. And it's very, very satisfying. And I think we excel in this whole... Um, area of can, how can I help you think better? And that's valid. That's a good thing. I don't think Dr. Smith is dismith, dismissing that. What he's saying is if our education stops there, if my pastoral ministry stops there, then I have not helped my people or my students in this transformation process like I should. To go after the cardia is, is, is really important. So in many ways, if I, if I was uh, I'm talking to pastors here, someone watching uh, as a pastor, say, you know, this would really help you just to help your people focus on their own desires. Well, where are my desires located? Hmm. Um, and, and that's what I found happening as I read the book as well. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is really helpful to move a pastor from thinking ideas to thinking what their people are desiring and helping them refocus on refocusing their desires, desiring kingdom yeah. life. It, in my own preaching, it's helped me in a, in a couple of ways. Um, I think, first of all, I, I now look at the idea that's being advocated in a sermon, and I will ask myself, what are the desires that really that, um, should be motivating or pulling this? So you might think of, well, desiring the kingdom is a desire for a certain demonstration of the kingdom today. That's very true throughout much of scripture. But even the idea of the kingdom as what it will be when it's perfect, when mm -hmm. it's full. Mm -hmm. You know, 1 John 3 says um, that we do not know uh, what we will be, but we will be like him. And the one who has this hope purifies himself. And if we as preachers can put before our people on a very regular basis, even from every many, many texts, right? That we are, we long for this day when, as Romans eight, the, as the as the creation mourns and groans for this day, that there is something that really changes in us, mm. that affects us. Mm. Interesting thing about desire, and, and Smith in the second part of his book points this out. It, it's not like you sit down and say, "I'm going to desire this more." How, how do you how do you change desires? That mm. kind of becomes the issue. How, how do we do this as educators? And he's, he, uh, he does a nice job of helping us understand that, that it's a kind of a whole body experience. It is, um, it, uh, our faith has to be physical. And on the one hand, of course, you, you, desires pull us. On the other hand, we do things and it increases desire. Mm -hmm. And it, it affects our desires. Now, think for a minute about your average school experience or your average church experience, which can be very passive. Right? I mean, uh, the expert is up there talking, and uh, it may not be very participatory. That's not a great way to impact people's desires. But if they are involved much more fully, then in fact, um, they're more likely to have their desires impacted and, and bring transformation. So the idea of liturgy, don't think liturgy just in terms of maybe a high church element, but rather liturgy is a, a, an ongoing participation that impacts our desires and leads us forward. Hmm. So uh, if I can give you another example, you know, if I'm a pastor and I'm thinking about reading this book and how it might affect the way I think about church ministry, it's not just preaching. I mean, I'm a preacher, so I like to think about preaching. But, but it's challenged me to think about even, um, and I've challenged our elders at our church because of this, to, to think about everything we do at the church. What, does, what, does, what happens on Sunday in terms of how it affects our desires. Hmm. Now, I come from a, a church that does not, has not historically practiced any like, vocal liturgical statement from, the, from a congregation. Over the last six months or so, we've been standing together at a certain point in our service and saying, we are the people of God, chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, being transformed by the Spirit, and on a journey to, the, uh, to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. Simple statement. Um, I didn't, it's not a magical statement, but it's been interesting to watch people now anticipating saying that 
They, they speak it, and they're looking forward to it. I think it's affecting our desires. It's not the magic of a statement. It's the fact that there's a participation on a regular basis. The Lord's Supper is a liturgy. So perhaps the most important liturgy in, in the church. And so uh, the, the practice of engaging in the Lord's Supper does affect our desires. Mm-hmm. We, we want to be more like Jesus. We long for the day when we will see Jesus. That, yeah, that engaging in the Lord's Supper week after week after week, hopefully, not a couple times a year, right? It's the regularity of it that begins to form our identities and form our desires, and behavior comes out from it. Okay. What, um, have you come across any other books that are like this? I mean, you have this, this uh, book uh, that's focusing on helping people change their desire to live more kingdom-like. Uh, is there any other uh, text out there that's it's, similar to that? It's very interesting. There are other books that deal with, you know, um, liturgy, of course. Mm-hmm. There, there are books that deal with uh, the theology of the kingdom or theologies of hope. So it's, it's not like these ideas are, are, it's not in an island here. They're, he's touching many, many subjects. I think one of the values, the unique things about this book is not that it's unrelated to anything else, but it's probably the most integrative that I've ever read in this area. Because, again, it, it, it connects, kind of connects the dots from these multiple disciplines. It rings true with the fact that, it, that this, is the, this is what people do. We, we are desiring people, whether you want to be or not. And um, so you have a, and you can approach that theologically. First John, you know, that says, uh, you know, to, to, to not love the world and the things of the world. That, that's speaking very much the idea that the world, the flesh, the, the, the lust of the eyes, we have these desires. We don't ask for them, mm-hmm. right? They're just part of us. Now, it's, it's helping people locate those desires and move them forward. So, so yeah, the ideas are dealt with in other books, probably many, probably scores. Um, but Dr. Smith has done the best job, I think, that I've found of integrating them into a whole. I'm very much concerned with not just theory, but helping those of us who are trying to work as educators and pastors and preachers. Okay. Well, Vic, thank you so much uh, for introducing us to this book, uh, Desiring the Kingdom by James Smith. And I trust that uh, this might be a book that might uh, uh, be uh, purchased, read, and used uh, to. Um, Encourage your your folks uh, that you minister to to be kingdom-focused.